Uh, finally, um, uh, Ingvild Jensen is founder and policy director for the NGO uh, ship uh, breaking platform. Um, if I understand it rightly, um, the, the NGO actually received quite a lot of bad press initially from uh, the shipping industry um, in terms of what they were pushing. But now we see a number of ship owner organizations uh, really uh, pushing the agenda of human rights and also the environmental issues with ship breaking. But with that short, short in, um, intro, the floor is yours. Thank you. First of all, thank you, David, for inviting the um, NGO shipbreaking platform to this conference. Um, the Human Rights at Sea is a member uh, organization of the NGO platform on uh, shipbreaking. I'll talk a bit more about what we do after having gone through um, what the current practices are, what the proposed uh, legislation is trying to do with the current practices, and then more about the solutions we see and how we work towards those solutions. So every year we, uh, we publish uh, data on all vessels that have been broken throughout the year. We track ownership, destination, um, where the vessel sailed before arriving, the breaking yard. Sometimes we also have information on the price um, of, uh, of the sale. Um, approximately 1,000 vessels, large ocean-going vessels, are broken every year. And more than 70% of the world end-of-life tonnage ends up on three beaches, one in India, one in Bangladesh, and one in Pakistan. Bangladesh was last year the number one destination for end-of-life vessels. Um, conditions there are really known to be the worst amongst the three South, South Asian countries. So even if this uh, issue has been on the agenda of the international European community and ship owners have been aware of the problems of uh, ship breaking on the beaches in South Asia for more than two decades, uh, Bangladesh still was number one destination last year. We expect that 2016 um, will, there will be an increase in the number of vessels. We've already seen many bulkers. Uh, retired and, and ended up on the beaches. Uh, Hanjin has been mentioned several times during this conference and we expect cargo vessels to, to be heading off to the scrapping yards and cruise vessels was also mentioned as maybe not this year but in the coming years to come. Uh, whether a vessel uh, hits a, a recycling or breaking yard or not of course depends on steel prices, on freight rates and and capacity. And last year, steel prices were very low. That's why we saw a slight decrease in the number of ships um, broken. The challenges of the current practices are many. I mean, they're related to social and workers' rights and also environmental pollution. Um, there's a high risk of accident um, at the beaching yards because they're the Vessels are ramped up on a beach. So migrant workers break them manually with torches. Huge blocks of steel fall off. So we see um, explosions, um, workers crushed by falling steel plates, or workers falling from, from uh, heights. Those are the main causes of fatal accidents. But then also these workers often work without protective um, uh, equipment and they are exposed to asbestos, they are exposed to toxic fumes when they're torch cutting the vessel and become often sick many years um, down the line. Um, there's a real lack of proper medical and healthcare facilities in, in both in India, Bangladesh and Pakistan near these yards. It will often take a worker more than an hour to reach a hospital where uh, he can be treated. This is um, not good in an industry which is so um, risky and where uh, serious accidents um, often occur. There's a breach of, of labor rights. These are migrant workers that are brought in via contractors. They lack contracts. Uh, they have no social protection. They have extremely poor living conditions. The, the sanitary uh, facilities are lacking and even workers in Bangladesh are even lacking drinking water. So you can imagine um, working with blow torches under such heat and not even being able to drink water. In Bangladesh, we also see um, high numbers of illegal child laborers, so children under the age of 18, which is 
not permitted in Bangladesh. This is classified as a red industry in Bangladesh, so a very hazardous industry. And then there are, of course, also um, emissions to the sea, to the ground, to the groundwater, and to the air. Um, oil pollution, uh, toxic paint chips falling off when these vessels are broken down in the intertidal zone where the water is then washing in and out uh, the toxic um, materials that, that fall off the ship. We also see that there are very um, poor quality and even misleading third-party surveys of these facilities. So most of the facilities in South Asia will claim that they're um, ISO 30,000 compliant, which is a specific ISO certificate uh, aimed at um, the ship recycling industry. Um, but we've seen many uh, strange companies handing out these certificates and there's no accredited body to hand these out, so um, it's all basically um, self-certifications. Um, and last of all, there's a huge lack of transparency. Um, journalists find it difficult to access these areas. Um, the NGOs we work with in these countries also have difficulties in accessing these areas, and this even more so when um, high-profile cases have, have come up and media reports have have been made, but uh, all, all this has made it more difficult for us to continue um, uh, looking into the conditions. So basically, the shipbreaking industry, where more than 70% than of the world's end-of-life tonnage, I mean, involves human rights violations and environmental crime. Um, so far this year, 16 workers have lost their lives in Bangladesh, and those are the ones we've been able to, to identify and, and map. Uh, we are often also able to identify the vessel upon which the accident happened, and we then contact the ship owner directly to inform him of, of this accident. Um, there's also a huge problem with lack of compensation and proper treatment of the workers who are severely injured. So workers um, will be handicapped for the rest of their life and they will not be able to find uh, a new occupation. For us, this is all about externalizing costs. Uh, the conditions in South Asia would never be allowed in any uh, European country, nor in the US, nor in, in East Asia, nor in China. Um, ship owners earn extra profits in selling their vessels to the beaching yards in South Asia. Uh, it was commented this morning that um, it would be impossible to make ship owners pay for proper re ship recycling. I don't think they would need to pay for the proper ship recycling. A vessel contains valuable steel and, and, and is an asset. Ship owners would just earn less profits if they opted for a, a more sustainable solution for the recycling of their vessels. This is um, a question of... of doing human rights due diligence in your supply chain and uh, dismantling a ship is a service provided to the ship owner, uh, a service um, which does not need to be paid for. Um, it's just they need to earn a bit less profit so that it's done in a proper way. So what, has, what kind of legislation has been put in place to deal with this? It's been on the agenda of the international community for a long time. Um, at the IMO, um, they developed the Hong Kong Convention, which was adopted in 2009. It's not a secret that the NGO shipbreaking platform and uh, many other NGOs globally criticized this convention for not setting high enough standards. It would uh, legitimize... Um, the, the beaching method, uh, but this was also the opinion of the majority of the countries, parties to the Basel Convention, which is a treaty dealing with the trade of hazardous wastes. It was also the opinion of the Special Rapporteur at the United Nations dealing with human rights and toxic waste, and also the opinion of several environmental legal experts. It was also the opinion of the European Parliament which called upon uh, Europe to go beyond the weak remedies of, of the IMO. And based in, in Brussels, the NGO shipbreaking platform has um, 
worked towards um, an EU ship recycling regulation, which entered into force uh, end of 2013. And the added value of this um, regulation, which um, takes on board most of the requirements of the Hong Kong Convention, but it goes slightly beyond in setting requirements for labor rights, which the Hong Kong Convention ignores. It also sets higher standards for the safety, for safety and environmental protection at the yards. So beaching facilities for would, for example, not pass the, the test of acceptability. It also sets requirements for the downstream waste management, which uh, the Hong Kong Convention ignores. So where all these um, wastes that come out of the ship end up, so that asbestos is not resold on the second-hand market, or oils just simply dumped on the side, or PCBs just simply uh, dumped uh, anywhere else. Um, it, provides, it will provide the, the world with an official global list of, of um, approved facilities, and it ensures independent certification and auditing. So it won't be up to um, the Bangladesh government to just say that all the facilities in Chittagong are Hong Kong compliant, which local authorities in Bangladesh are currently saying, or the same in Alang, where the Gujarat Maritime Board is claiming that the facilities in Alang are operating up against higher standards than the Hong Kong Convention. This would not be possible under the EU ship recycling regulation, where independent certification and auditing would, would be needed. And there are several safeguards um, for compliance with these, other safeguards for compliance with the facility requirements, um, which also then, in addition to the independent certification and the possibility for the Commission to audit the facilities, um, NGOs such as ours or any other <coughs> stakeholder who would feel um, involved in this issue can raise a complaint and ask the European Commission to act upon that complaint. So for us, sustainable ship recycling is, is at the yard. I mean, proper PPE, training, safe and decent working conditions, and containment of pollutants at the yard. <coughs> but it's also outside the yard. Where do the workers work? Um, how do they have adequate medical facilities? Is there proper downstream waste management? And the added value of, of the EU list is, again, that this is a government-backed independent certification and auditing scheme. So a service to the shipping industry, and ship owners have asked for a kind of global list of approved facilities. So the EU is, is providing, very shortly, ship owners with this list, as um, the list is expected to be published by the end of, of this year. So for us, sustainable ship recycling is, is clearly off the beach. You cannot um, have safe and, and pollution-free um, ship recycling when you're cutting a vessel in a, on an intertidal beach. Uh, this does not mean that you cannot do proper ship recycling in India, Bangladesh, or Pakistan. And, and the EU reg ship recycling regulation does not um, exclude these destinations as possible future destinations for proper ship recycling. Uh, just to, to illustrate, in, in 1999, just um, a couple of kilometers away from Alang, the famous uh, ship recycling area in India, there was a facility backed by the Gujarat um, state and private Japanese investments, a facility called Pipavav, which was built. And the aim of that yard was to... Um, accommodate all the uh, upcoming uh, international oil tankers, which were to be broken due to the, the, the provisions on the, the single hull oil tankers. And uh, there, were, there was identified a need for a growing um, capacity to deal with the international fleet. So this pip of a facility was a dry dock. It could break huge amounts of, of vessels. They had proper downstream waste management. The Japanese government would, uh, would assist the Indian government in improving the conditions. They, would ev they were even envisaging um, breaking the vessels with, with water uh, cutting instead of torch cutting. So, I mean, this was, this was wanted and possible in India already in 1999. Uh, what happened is that uh, most ship owners uh, did not opt for Pipavav because obviously they could get higher prices 
uh, in the Alang facilities on the beach in, in Alang. So Pippa Vavnawa does ship repair and shipbuilding. But some ship owners um, are, are doing uh, um, things. And uh, one example is Buscalis that has uh, entered into a private uh, partnership with a yard in Mexico. So they're helping uh, establish a, a, a proper facility. There are many facilities already in existing today in China, in Europe, that are operating under capacity. So if a ship owner says, well, there's no other, other possibility than to go to the beaching yards in South Asia, that's not true. Um, uh, there is a lot of dormant capacity, even in Europe, to, to do um, proper ship recycling. We also know of two projects in India that are currently being looked into to establish uh, facilities that would operate off the beach. For us, it's a question of demand, and if ship owners demand proper ship recycling, there will be uh, more than enough supply. But unfortunately, most ship owners today do not demand better practices. I mean, uh, Bangladesh was number one destination last year. Uh, these are the countries from which uh, vessels um, originate that ended up on the beach in, in 2015. We see that uh, Greece, uh, one of the largest ship-owning countries, also is uh, one sending most vessels uh, for breaking. It's not, it's not a big surprise, these figures, but uh, there are also well-known companies that uh, sell their vessels to the, to the beaching yards. Um, some of them are here. But then if we look at the flags, uh, we'll see that um, the flags are very different from the ownership. So um, it's not a big secret that uh, shipping uses... Uh, different flags, and Panama is one of the largest flags, so Panama also sends um, most vessels to the breaking yards, but then uh, St. Kitts and Nevis and Comoros also come here, and St. Kitts and Nevis is, is number two, so whilst um, maybe the registry was introduced as being on the good side on some issues, on, on this issue it's on the ugly end, uh, and uh, I would like to, to personally just mention, um, having worked for Willemsen in the beginning of your career, Willemsen is one of the few uh, ship-owning companies that does a good job on this, so uh, maybe uh, hook up with some of your former colleagues to, uh, <laughs> to uh, change the uh, St. Kitts and Nevis policy on this, because St. Kitts and Nevis, for example, proposes discounts for last voyage registration. And St. Kitts and Nevis is very popular with these two companies, which are the two largest uh, cash buying companies. So these are companies specialized in buying end of life vessels and selling them to South Asia. These are the companies that contact ship owners, tell them we have a solution for you, give a certain price to a ship owner. So a ship owner always knows where the vessel will end up because the, of the price being proposed. Also by being in touch with these companies, so it's very likely it will end up in Bangladesh, India or Pakistan. And uh, these companies uh, rename the vessel, reflag the vessel, recrew the vessel, and uh, St. Kitts and Nevis is a popular flag with, with these um, cash buyers, as is Comoros, as is uh, Niu, a new flag that has popped up in our list, a small island which, uh, which hardly owns any ships, but suddenly has large end-of-life vessels uh, on its fleet. So whilst I mean, the, we do support the EU ship recycling regulation, the problem, as is with the Hong Kong Convention, it relies on flag state jurisdiction. And when you look at end-of-life vessels, you have rather irresponsible flags actually owning these. Or the, the flags used for end-of-life vessels are not the most responsible flags. Many of them are black or grey listed by the Paris Memorandum of Understanding, uh, for example. And when I, I will not expect that St. Kitts and Nevis and Bangladesh are going to solve the shipbreaking problems of today. This is what the Hong Kong Convention is asking. They're asking St. Kitts and Nevis, Comoros and Bangladesh to solve the shipbreaking problems. For us, it's the ship owners that should be held responsible. Uh, they are the ones that should be demanding um, proper ship recycling. And at the European level, one way of 
incentivizing them towards the choice of better ship recycling facilities is by introducing a financial incentive. And this is the current debate at the European level where a financial incentive would be added to the ship recycling regulation where monies would be collected at every entry to a European port set aside for that ship, uh, that specific ship, and the last owner of the vessel can get that money back if uh, he or she opts for an um, EU-listed ship recycling facility. So uh, for those of you who don't know who we are, I mean, we're a coalition of NGOs, environmental and human rights NGOs, many based in India, Bangladesh and Pakistan. Um, we uh, have our secretariat based in Brussels, but we are active in all the, the ship recycling countries except China, where access is difficult for NGOs and, and trade unions. Um, it was mentioned this morning as well that um, NGOs often have a Western perspective of things. Well, in our NGO, half of our membership comes from uh, the South Asian countries. And in 2009, the Bangladesh High Court, Supreme Court of Bangladesh, actually closed the entire industry for a couple of months because the industry was not complying with uh, Bangladesh's own uh, human rights, labor rights, environmental laws. The reason why all these facilities, almost all of these facilities, are, are open again is, is due to another issue which was talked about this morning, corruption and bribery. So these facilities are well connected and they pay local officers, they get their environmental clearance certificates with uh, clearly stating that they do not comply but they get six months to comply and this is extended and extended and extended. So we will continue with our litigation also in the, the South Asian countries. Thank you for your attention, and if you want to learn more, <laughs> website.